All right, video is going. All right, it's another Wednesday night. It's November the 8th, right? Yeah. Of the year 2023. And since it's a Wednesday night, we're going to continue on with 1 Thessalonians. And tonight we're going to look at 3, 6 through 10. And um, this is just kind of it's a little section where Paul just expresses his... It's, it's, it's Thanksgiving again. He's, he's did that three times now. Enjoyed that that when Timothy got back, um, things were good with their faith. Things weren't good, but things were good with their faith. So I guess in the end, that's all that matters, right? <laughs> Don't matter if it's good or bad. What you're going through is just making sure your faith's intact. So Paul's, Paul's happy. All right. All right, so if you're like me, you're like, I'll take some more good news. Well, here you go. All right, so in um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, 6 through 10, I'll read that. And then tonight, we're going to pray for a little guy. His name's Nash Yoder, and uh, he's the grandson of the assistant four-score pastors in, in um, Ark City. And um, from what I, the report I just heard is that he... Uh, he has cancer, and he's fighting for his life right now. So I don't know what his age is, but but we're gonna we're gonna pray for him. So and we'll pray that we'll pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Sound good? Because we don't need any wars. There's wars and rumors of wars right now. It means we're getting closer to the end time. And earthquakes. There's earthquakes happening. <laughs> Matthew 24 stuff. All right, here we go. Verse 6, But now that Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news of your faith and love, that you always, that you always have good remembrance of us, greatly desiring to see us as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, in all of our affliction and distress, we were comforted concerning you by your faith. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God for you, for all the joy with which we rejoice for, this, for your sake before our God, night and day praying exceedingly that we may see your face and, and, and perfect what is lacking in your face, in your faith. There it is. All right. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we curse this cancer. And Nash, little Nash, Lord, we ask, Lord, that you will breathe on him and breathe life into him. And, Lord, we just ask that you, you comfort the parents, give them that tenacity faith. And, Lord, we pray the same for the grandparents and for the whole church out there in Ark City and Pastor Richard and Tammy, Lord, and Lord, I just ask that you just you just touch them with a special touch, Lord, and just give them that greater grace and, and everything that they need, Lord, to pray and see Nash recover and be done with this. And Lord, we bind any spirit that is attached to this. We bind any discouraging spirits that are messing with them and, and, and the rest of the church family out there. And, Lord, we thank you that you are the healer. And, Lord, they brought the kids to you to bless them. Lord, you receive kids. And, Lord, you don't want them sick either. So, Lord, we just give you praise, glory, and honor for that. Lord, we ask for the peace of Jerusalem. Lord, we ask that Israel will not be at war. And, Lord, we just, we just ask that on the war front in Ukraine and other places, Lord, that peace talks will happen and this will settle down. So, Lord, that we will not go into a world war. And, Lord, we give you praise, glory, and honor, Lord. You are in control and we trust you. And now we ask, Lord, that you speak to us tonight as we go through this passage. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. So verse 6, but now that Timothy has come to us from you and brought good news of your faith and love, 
and that you always have a good remembrance of, of us, greatly desiring to see us, as we also to see you. All right. Of course, that thought goes on. All right. So, the good thing is, Paul is relieved now. You'll see this as we go through it. He's relieved now that they, they have no hard feelings towards him because trouble happened when he came and, got, and, they, and they got saved. And um, Paul, you're like, well, why would Paul be worried about that? Because you'll see in my notes, I put a little thing in there about the, the Corinthians. Some of them were mad at him because of the trouble he caused or the trouble he went through or, you know, why do we have an apostle who goes to who who ends up in jail? You know, people, people. Yeah, that was actually in Philippi. He was writing to them. People were uh, taking advantage of that to speak down upon him to make themselves look good in leadership. <laughs> it's like, it's like you're speaking against the apostle Paul. <laughs> good grief. So, anyways, Paul's had to deal with some of that. That's why he was hoping that the Thessalonians were all right, and they are. So. Again with verse 6, but now that Timothy has come, has come, it's a participle, it's heiress and active, and yeah, it happened. That's about all you get out of the Greek grammar there. Has come to us from you and brought us, brought us, the good news is how Mounds puts this, and uh, the word us, you just kind of have to insert in there. It's in there. Anyways, it's another participle, and this one's heiress. But this time it's in the middle voice. So Timothy did take himself from one location to the other to get them this good news. All right. Of your faith and love that you always have, always have a, a good report, or Mounts translates that word with. It's just present and active. And then going on from there, um, A good report, you remember us greatly desiring, or our uh, mounts just translates it long. You long to see us, and that's a part of simple, and it's present and active. So presently and actively right now, the feeling is mutual between the Thessalonians and Paul. All right, and then to see us, that's just an infinitive said in the aorist tense of the active voice, and it's just... You just take it as a general tense, nothing nothing really there. But anyways, moving on with all this, this letter was most likely written as soon as Timothy got back with Paul and Silas with this good news that their faith, with their faith, they received. All right, I'm going to stop there for a second. So Paul, most likely, as soon as Timothy came and told them the good news, and of course I've showed you this a couple times, they were in Corinth waiting for, for uh, the, the report from them. Um, they probably started writing this letter right back to them. And then that they received their faith, their, the faith that they had, go back to three, remembering without ce ce uh, one three, sorry, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love, your patience and hope of the Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father. So their faith kicked off right. And Paul was hoping that they were still pretty solid in their faith, and here's the good news. They were. So, it's still working in love. All right. If you're a Christian and you are, and your faith is still intact, and you've been through some things, and you can still love people, that's how you know <laughs> you're doing it. <laughs> if, you're, if you've been through something, and your faith has been attacked, and you start getting ugly and bitter. Yeah. Yeah. You want to repent. You want your heart not to get hard. You want to stay soft. You want to bless those who persecute you. You don't want to unbury the axe that you helped them bury and then pick it back up and stick it in their skull. I've been there. <laughs> And it wasn't right, and I had to repent, pray, bury that hatchet again, <laughs> not unearth it, stick it in their cranium. Yes. So, the good thing is, these people, they still have the love of God in them. Praise God. Amen? Amen. All right. 
May that be all of us, right? All right. Well, here's some evidence that that's a good thing. Let's go to uh, Galatians. Galatians is after 2 Corinthians, Pastor John. All right. Here we go. 5, 6. All right. Yeah. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcised nor uncircumcised avails anything. So it don't matter if you're a Jew, Gentile, and who your daddy is. All right. That don't matter. But faith working through love. That's the only thing that, that matters, and that's the only thing you can measure yourself by if you're actually living out the Christian life right. Amen? Amen. All right. Now, here's something. They have good remembrance, and they greatly desire to see Paul and the crew. All right? Is that good? That's good evidence. So to see other believers with that type of, of desire is a good thing. And Paul says that uh, a handful of times. I could have gave you like six verses on this, but we'll just look at three. Romans 1, uh, 11. Paul has never met the Romans when he wrote this. And he says this to them. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gifts so that you may be established. Paul didn't start that church. Paul knew about that church. Paul knew they had a, some problems with the Jews and Gentiles getting along. Paul addresses that, but Paul wants to see them. He would love to see them and talk to them and impart some type of blessing and bless them. Now, we've had some special speakers come through. Have you guys been blessed by them? Yeah. That's what Paul wanted to do. He wanted to come see them. Never, never knew them, but he loved them praying for them, wrote them a letter, a really good letter. <laughs> so there we go, First fifth, uh, Philippians uh, 1.8. Now, Paul knew these people and loved these people. They were his bros, just like the Thessalonians. For God is my witness how greatly I long to see you with all affections of Christ Jesus. And then, of course, Timothy, he was his son, spiritual son. So 2 Timothy 1.4, you'll see this language again. Greatly de desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. And that's a really powerful passage, but we've looked at that back when we went through Timothy. So, these people greatly desire to see Paul and his crew as well. That's Silas and, uh, and Timothy, and of course anyone else with them. And they felt the same about seeing them. If you go back to 2.17 um, of the book we're in, First Thessalonians, you'll see this. But we, brethren, have been taken away from you for a short time in the presence, not in heart, endeavoring more eagerly to see your faith, face with great desire. So, yeah, that's how the Christian life should, should work and look, amen? Going on with this, which means that there was no hard feelings about the trouble that happened there. Did trouble happen there? Yeah, that church was birthed in trouble. Here we go. Uh, 2.14. For you, brethren, became imitators of the church of God, which is in Judea, in Christ Jesus. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans. All right. We're going through the book of John on Sunday nights. Is the book of John anti-Semitic? No, it is not. That's just new world order, stupid counterculture crap to take down the word of God and make you think that it's hate speech. It's nonsense. Jesus was a Jew. John was a Jew. Peter, James, and John were Jews. All the apostles, all the disciples were Jews, and then they became apostles. Not every, good, not every Jew is a good Jew because one of, one of the disciples was a devil. And that's what the book of John tells you. And then when you get to verse 8, or chapter 8, he has to look at some of those Jews and tell them, Abraham is not your father. And the, my father that I serve, he's not your father either. Your father's the devil. Did he mean all Jews? No. But people are stupid. And more on that when I preach next. <laughs> all right, moving on. But yeah, book of John, good stuff. 
All right, here we go. It should look like the love that the Thessalonians have. That's how we should be living. Amen? All right. Verse 7. Therefore, brethren, in all of our affliction and distress, we were comforted. I'll just stop there because that's the only action word. Uh, Mounts translates that. We, were, we have been assured. It's, it's, a, it's a verb. It's, 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 er, it's in the aorist tense. Just take it as a past tense. But it's also in the passive voice. So meaning when Timothy got there, Paul received that good news. He, 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 it, it, it happened to him, and he was like, yeah, good. So that's what the Greek grammar is doing. Yeah, Greek grammar. Woo! That might just start a revival now that I explained it to you, right? All right, moving on. All right, so we were comforted concerning you by your faith. Why? Because it was standing, amen? All right, Paul could be talking about the psychological affliction and distress. Now, being run out of a town, that's, that's, some, that's some affliction and distress. But I got to thinking about what the scholar was saying, and I have to, I have to agree with him. It could be talking about the affliction and distress of having to leave them and sit with anxiety in Corinth and just wait to find out how they are doing. The more I thought about that, yeah, that would drive me nuts. Now, here's, 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 here's something you can do to give yourself some grace. Have you ever worried about someone? Have you ever prayerfully worried about someone? Have you ever put them in God's hands and then you picked them back up and then you put them in God's hands? Or have you ever been in a situation where you keep giving it to God, but you pick it back up? All right. There's evidence here that even Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, struggles with that too. He greatly desired to see these people. He, and, and now he's sitting in Corinth and he's having, he may be having some anxiety and some affliction about it. I'm sure he was praying for them given to God, getting peace. I'm sure he was what they, the Pentecost, us Pentecostals talk about praying through. I'm sure he was doing all that. But then there's that still, that unknown. How are they actually doing? So give yourself a break. Keep praying. Do pray through. But uh, if, someone, if someone is teaching you that Christianity is just, well, you just pray and trust God, and then you go back to your rose garden, that's not real life. And if it is, then I need to sit down and someone else needs to teach. Amen. <laughs> All right, moving on. But yeah, I could see that affliction and distress just sitting there wondering, Lord, let them be okay. <laughs> Here we go. Now he is now comforted concerning them. Praise God. Just as he has been with other churches that, that has brought him good news that they were doing well. Well, then I added this in the notes, or others there are doing well. You're like, Why, why'd you do that? If you study First and Second Corinthians, you'll find out there was a group of Corinth, uh, there was a group, there's a group in Corinth that didn't like Paul. They thought, you know what? Let's stop claiming Paul as our apostle. Let's claim one of those Greek guys that we really like, like Apollos. You know, or you know, Peter came and and, and, and met up with us. Some of us were like, you know what, let's just claim him as our leader because Paul, I mean, he's, he's not really that great to look at. He's really not that great of a speaker. But when he does speak, miracles happen, but no, nor that, you know. Um, yeah, let's just, let's just pick someone else. <laughs> and other people, they were like, no, he started us. If it wasn't for him, we wouldn't have salvation. So anyways, Paul... Paul has a hard time with the, with, the, with, the, with the Corinthians, but there was a core group there that were still his people. So anyways, that's why I put that note in there, because their scholar says, look at Corinthians. Yeah, I've looked at Corinthians. <laughs> yeah, so anyways, 1 Corinthians 2, 3, you'll see, you'll, I think you'll see trouble, and then we'll see good news. Here we go. Yeah, I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. Now the scholar was saying, when Paul got to Corinth, he was probably still sh shooken out of his wits about what just happened in Berea and Thessalonica, and he was probably thinking, Lord, I'm, I'll, I'll start a church here, but, you know, <laughs> I need you. And if you've ever been nervous behind the pulpit, yeah, yeah, give yourself a break there. 
Amen? Because, <laughs> yeah, it's a scary thing. It's a scary thing to lead other Christians and to preach and to talk to people about Jesus if you've never done it. But Paul did it, and, and signs and miracles and wonder happened, happen, and he got his church going. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 7, 3 through 7. And then here's him just talking to him. I did not say this to condemn you, for I have I've said before that you are in my heart to die together and to live together. Great is my boldness of speech towards you. Great is my boasting on your behalf. I am filled with comfort. I am exceedingly joyful in all of our tribulation. So second, when Second Corinthians came around to being written, uh, some of the Corinthians started to really repent and get themselves together. And uh, realize, yeah, Paul is the one who got it started. For indeed, when I came uh, to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Outside were, were, were uh, uh, conflicts, inside were fear. Nevertheless, God who comforts the downcast comforts us by the coming of Titus. And not only this, by his coming, but also by the consolation which, uh, which he had comfort in you, when he told us of your earnest desire, there you go, check that out. They wanted to see Paul too. And your mourning and your zeal for me, so I rejoiced even more. So, Paul had quite a time with the Corinthians. If you ever read through 2 Corinthians, it's about suffering well for God. That's what 2 Corinthians is for. Paul, Paul defends his apostleship by how much he suffered to birth this church. Yeah, that's 2 Corinthians. Yeah, real cherry. Yeah. First Peter, by the way, is about how to suffer well for Jesus. So, yeah, is suffering in the Christian experience? Yes. Yes, it is. So, back to the Thessalonians. Paul is probably really, again, struggling with anxiety and prayer. And then, of course, he probably was praying what we call praying through. But then, how do you guys know? You guys know how the devil will just come along and put something back in your head? Once you get a victory, and then all of a sudden, pfft, yeah. He was probably dealing with that. So, yeah. Moving on with all that. Their faith did not waver due to the persecution, but thrived. Amen? Because he said your faith was strong, and, and not... Uh, 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 T- Timothy brought that back, just like we saw in, in 2 Corinthians. Paul was relieved by Titus' report about how the, the Corinthians were doing here. He is relieved by what Timothy had to tell him. So here we go. Verse 8. Here's a short little fun verse. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. Church, I will live fine if you all will stand fast (laughs) in the Lord. (laughs) Yeah, I'll let you figure out the application there. (laughs) All right. Yeah, yeah. Stop giving me trouble. No. Yeah, I can't say that. That's not nice. All right, could be true, but it's not nice. All right, moving on. For we now live if you stand fast in the Lord. All right, we live presently and actively, yes. Stand firm, yes. If you will stand firm, I will stand firm presently and actively, amen? Yay, Greek grammar. We make sense in English. Moving on. Paul and the team now can live because... They are relieved of the anxiety with the good news that these Thessalonians are standing fast in the Lord. Now, that word stand stand fast, or sometimes you'll see it translated hold fast, there's a line of t-shirts that are about that, and you might see me wear that. That that is a pretty cool word. Yeah. What do we do with the message of the gospel? We hold onto it like it's life. Because it is. It's going to get us through and keep our faith strong no matter what we go through. Amen? Amen. Amen. So Paul has, inst- Paul has expressed this instructions for, for, for his own relief elsewhere. So he said this to the Corinthians. Please, for the love of Jesus and what he did for us on the cross, hold, stand fast. Uh, Stay strong in the Lord. Here we go. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Watch. Stand fast. There it is. 
And then I just lost my place. Yeah, in the faith. Be brave, brave, be strong. All right. So that was one church that was having problems that he gives them that advice. Here's another church that was having problems, and he gave them that advice too. Galatians 5.1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Basically telling them, you think you're becoming good Jews, you're actually trading your old witchcraft for new. That's what he was telling them. Philippians 1, 27. Now, these are his friends. These people are doing good, but, you know, he gives them the advice as well. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I am absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. All right, and then you go to four one. Therefore, my beloved and long and long for brethren, my joy and crown. So stand fast in the Lord, beloved. There you go. So the churches that he was happy with and the churches he was concerned with, he gave them the same thing. What do we do? We hang on to the message of the cross. We hang on to the understanding that Jesus spilt his blood. And he paid for our atonement of sin. That's a big old theological word I can get into. And today I was thinking about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. You guys know who he was? One of the last orders that Hitler did before he, before he shot himself, he told his people, he, he, he gave orders to take Dietrich Bonhoeffer out of, out of the prison cell and hang him. Who was Dietrich Bonhoeffer? He was a theologian, he was a pastor, he was a spy, and he loved his nation, Germany, and wanted to rid them of this dude who was bringing it down. Dietrich Bonhoeffer could have, could have left Germany, stayed here in the United States, and continued to teach the Bible because he was a really smart guy. He was a pastor theologian. He was definitely one of those. So he wrote a book. I suggest you read it sometime. It's called The, the Cost of Discipleship. And he said, you know what? As Christians, we shouldn't have what he called cheap grace. You're like, what did he mean by that? Well, it took me years to really think about it. Like I said, he was super smart. And I, one day I finally was like, okay, yeah, I'm really getting what he's saying. Does that message of the cross mean anything to you guys? Should it change how you live? Yeah. What he was saying is, don't preach or believe from a gospel message that, hey, Jesus paid for it, so just accept him and have a good time. No, you, you should accept Jesus and let his spirit change you because he shed his blood. He gave up his life so you can have life. Should that change our life? That was costly grace. That cost him everything. That cost the father his very best. You guys understand what cheap grace is now? You'll hear it in American churches. People still preach it. People still get what they call gospel light. So, with all that said, how do we stand fast? How do we hold fast? We really think about what God did for us, and we love him too. Amen? Amen. All right, so that was a quick little sermon I had to throw in there. All right, moving on. Verse 9. Now, this, this verse is very interesting because it's a question, and some people think it goes all the way to 10. I'll show you that this is what the King James believes. It goes all the way to 10, but we'll look at 9 first. For what thanks can we render to God for you, for all the joy with we, which we rejoice for your sake before our God? All right. So, uh, let me read that again. For what thanks can we? Uh, it's, a, it's a verb, it's present, but it's also passive. Uh, can we? Yeah. I really don't know what to make out of that. It's just interesting. <laughs> Moving on. Render or return, it's an infinitive, it's aorist and active. So, okay. He's just generally saying that. And then, um, moving on with that. Um, yeah, 
to God for you with all the joy with which we rejoice. And that's present and active, which in English we pretty much will understand that. So he's asking a question, what thanks can I return to God that you guys are doing good? <laughs> that's pretty much what he's saying. So some people see verse 9 and 10 as a question like our King James, but the New American Standard does the same thing. Some see this verse, verse 9, as a question. Um, the, the New, Ameri uh, the, the New Inter uh, International Version, the NIV, and also Mounts, our Greek scholar, he thinks that this is just a question and, a, and 10 is not. Okay. But our scholar sees the question is actually 8 and 9, which is interesting. So he thinks that he's asking a question back in 8 when he says, For now we live if... You stand fast in the Lord, because what thanks can I give God that you guys are doing well? That's how our, that's how our, our Bible scholar, uh, Mr. Bruce, F.F. F. Bruce, sees it. So, very interesting. D different ways to translate it. But I still think we can uh, get, get everything out of it, whether it's a question or not. So, this question is similar to Psalms 116.12. And uh, for those who are out there at, at my uncle's graveside service, um, I've always wondered where they got where they got precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. So I decided to read the whole psalm and went, oh, that's where that's at. So I shared that out there. I, I read the whole thing. It was it's a it's a great it's a great psalm to work, to read in a funeral. Pretty interesting. But anyways, the person in this psalm is about to die, and, but he's also He's mournful, but he's also thanking God for his life and what his life was. And what, and what, what he says in 12 is, What shall I render to the Lord for all of his benefits towards me? So it's a, it's a question like that. A good question we could ask ourselves, Lord, with everything you've done for me, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to live? What is your calling? What, how should I go about this day? You know, so yeah, that's a good question. Lord, how can I repay you or how can I thank you? Well, like Diedrich Bonhoeffer, don't make cheap grace. Don't take it cheap. Take it costly. Let it change your life. Amen. That's the answer. However it looks. Yeah. So, so it's a similar question to uh, Psalms 116.12 that the answer is yes, we cannot be thankful enough for the breath of life and the gift of salvation which this church was abounding in to Paul's comfort. So, yeah, the answer is yes. <laughs> you can't thank God enough. That's the answer. So, um, I know at the end, you know, we're in the month of November, and we're all going to sit down and eat some turkey or ham or whatever and give thanks to God. Can you thank him enough? No. 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 Enjoy, enjoy the dinner. I'm hungry now. But, you know, but we cannot thank God enough for all of his goodness towards us. Amen. So when Paul prays this for the church in his time of prayer, so if you look at uh, 1, 2 of this, it says, We give thanks to God for you all, making mention of you in our prayers so when paul prays this is one of the things that he's praying and then if you look at 213 for this reason we're thank we also thank god without ceasing because when we received the word of god which you heard from us you welcomed it not as the word of men but it is in truth the word of god which also so effectively worked works in you who believe so let me just kind of unpack this have you ever been thankful for a fellow believer in your life who, who was strong in the faith and helped you in a time of need that you were in? You guys, I think you guys understand what this verse is getting at. You could not be thankful for God enough. We could not be thankful for God enough for the person who finally shared the gospel and you made sense to you and you received Jesus. You cannot be thankful enough for that person. Amen. Amen. Yeah, that's how. Yeah, that's that's what I'm getting at and seeing. So, he now has joy, which has been replaced with the anxiety of affliction. Back in seven, this is being present. So, this prayer, when he's in the, in the prayer of this, this is being in the presence of God in prayer. In verse ten, if you go back to verse ten, um, 
Yeah, not yeah, when we get to verse 10. That's right. We're about to get to verse 10. Night and day praying exceedingly that we may see your face. So when he is praying, when he is praying, it's in his time of prayer, which could be any time during the day. But also it is an it is also the eschatological day, the end day, the day that Jesus comes back. So he's also saying that too in this. And if you look at one three, you'll see this. Yeah, remembering without ceasing uh, your work of faith, your labor of love, um, and patience of hope in, God, in, in the Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God, of our God and Father. So it is a time of prayer. And 2.19, uh, For what is our hope and joy or crown of rejoicing? Is, is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ? So you can see it's at it's, it, you can see that it's when you're praying to him. But how's that verse in at his coming? It also means the day we're all going to stand before him. And then in three thirteen, so he may establish your hearts blamelessly in holiness before our God and Father at his coming of the Lord Jesus Christ with all of his saints. So Paul is saying. What thanks can I give God when I'm talking to God? And what thanks am I going to give God when I stand before him? I can't thank him enough that you guys are doing well. I find that encouraging. What do you guys think? You find that encouraging? That's cool. Yeah. So anyways, let's finish up. We're going long now. All right, here we go. Verse 10. All right. Here we go. Night and day. So this could be a continue of the question, or it could just be Paul making the statement. This is what I do, night and day, praying exceedingly that we may see your faith, face, face, sorry, face and faith is t twisting my tongue. I'm going to have to talk to Paul when I get in heaven. All right. Could you use a different word? When I look straight in your eyes, <laughs> and, <laughs> all right. Night and day, praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. There it is. I spit it out. All right. So, night and day, praying, or we pray is how Mounts puts it. It's a par participle. It's, pr it's, it's, it's uh, present, but it's also passive. So, yeah. Yeah. Praying has some receiving to it. Amen. Exceedingly that we may see, we may see, it's just an infinitive, it's errors and active, so it happens, all right? It's happening, and it happens. That's probably why you use errors, because errors could just kind of be a general tense. And then, um, uh, see your face and perfect what is lacking. So perfect, or supply, is how Mounts puts that. And again, it's, it's an infinitive, and it's also errors and active, so any given time. So, Paul has mentioned night and day. If you go back to 2.9, he's talking about them, uh, how they would labor in the Lord. For, for you remember, brethren, our labor. Yeah, and he's also talking about his labor. Labor and toil, and, and for, uh, for laboring night and day, that we, we might not be a burden to anyone, we preach the gospel of God. Yeah, preach to you the gospel of God. So, yeah, yeah. Um, it is true. It is. It is possible. Yeah. Let, let me just put it this way. Yeah. Thank you, Holy Spirit. <laughs> it is possible to, to be doing work for God night and day, and not actually pick up anything heavy. How do How do you do that? You pray. You can go through your day and just be interceding for people. You really can. You could be doing God's work night and day or you may be setting up a um uh, a concert like willie's done you may be setting up a concert you you might be laboring and actually doing something that's going to bring the gospel out that's true or you might be setting up church you know the getting getting the church all ready to set up for a special speaker you know you might be here helping me do that you're actually doing labor but you know what while you're doing that you could be praying <laughs> you could be praying for the event <laughs> You could be laboring in the Lord, actually doing labor, <laughs> or you could be laboring in the Lord 
and be praying. So anyways, there you go. All right. So, so, uh, yeah. So night and day praying for Paul was, uh, exceedingly given, given that he could give them. Paul was, uh, exceedingly, I messed that sentence all up, didn't I? He wanted to give them more instruction face to face. There we go. 217, you see this. But we, brethren, have been taken away from you for a short time in, in present, not in heart, in, endeavoring more, to, to, more eagerly to see you, your face with great desire. So Paul wanted to go and see them and give them more instruction. But if that was not possible, then he has given them the instruction they need to perfect them when we get to chapter 4 all the way through chapter 5. You're like, well, what's chapter 4 and 5 about? It is the meat and the potatoes of what he actually has to say to them. He has taken three chapters to say, you guys are great. It is so good to hear from you. <laughs> I love you guys. You have just blessed my socks off. I just thank God for you. You know what? I just thank God for you. I'm going to write a second Thanksgiving text. You know what? I'm just going to throw a third one in there. I can't thank God enough for you guys. I love you guys. It is so good to hear from you. I know you went through H-E double hockey sticks, man. You just went through it, but your faith is there. Praise God. He takes three chapters to say that. <laughs> and then he finally gets to chapter 4 and 5. So what's, what's up with chapter 4 and 5? Well, I thank God they didn't understand what happens when a body dies and what they should do, because now I have stuff to read at a funeral, which I just read this afternoon. I always read chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. If I do any more funerals, I'm going to have that memorized. All right, here we go. So he writes the rest of this book to perfect them, with which their faith, their faith was doing good, but Paul needed to instruct them more in what they did not understand. So Paul makes it clear that he wants to see them again to give them this instruction, to give them more instruction, but... If he can't, he's going to write it now. So here it, here it is. You're like, well, w w what, is, what is 4 and 5? So I just did a quick little summary. The rest of the instruction is how to live for Jesus. Is that important? What happens to those in Christ who pass away? Yeah, that's why I always read chapter 4, 13 through 18 when I do a graveside. Which has to do with the resurrection of believers in the second coming. That's all in chapter 4. And in chapter 5 is how to view the end times as a Christian who is living daily for him. Does that sound important? It is important. Do you guys think we're in the last days? We're definitely gotten closer to it. <laughs> that is a guaranteed statement right there. I guarantee that statement I just made. We are definitely getting closer to it because we always are. <laughs> we always are getting closer to it. So, the, the book of 1 Thessalonians, we are now going to get into the meat and potatoes of it after next week because he's going to continue to say some more things about, dang, you know what, guys? I love you. <laughs> Praise God for you. <laughs> the next week, they, they said this is like a wish prayer. I was like, no, I think that is is his prayer. So, anyways, be encouraged on the video. Um, just love people and greatly desire to see other Christians and see how well they're doing. Amen? Amen. All right, I'll leave the Internet people with that.